IT, forging IT security experts. Secure Ninja. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia Webb with Secure Ninja TV, and I'm here at Black Hat 2013 at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm here with my co-host, Michael Vienne. He's the Chief Hacking Officer with Secure Ninja, and we are speaking with Richard Bailey. He's the Chief Security Officer at Mandian. Richard, how are you? Great, thank you. Awesome, thanks so much for talking with us. We uh, spoke with you at RSA mm -hmm. just last February, and it was a great interview. Uh, we talked about the Chinese hacking situation mm -hmm. and the APT report. Mm -hmm. Um, what kind of uh, follow-up has occurred since then? Well, I guess there's sort of been two sides to it. One has been what's happened to Mandiant as a company. So mm -hmm. we've had some attention from different actors out there. We can't necessarily say who they are or why they're interested in us, but we've had denial of service attacks. We've had uh, additional reconnaissance on our web properties, things that go beyond what we usually see or saw at least before the report came out. Um, we've had a couple other little things like that. Nothing we couldn't handle, thankfully, so that was one side. The second side has been just interest in the problem in general. So we've been asked, how did you create this report? How were we able to do such a thing without classified information? Um, what do you think we should do about it? And those questions have come not from just private companies, but also from different policymakers and congressional staffers, and in some cases, the representatives themselves. So we were quite busy in the month of March fielding those sorts of questions. So how did you create the report? What types of techno technologies did you use? Um, what type of access was required in order to gather this data? The report was a sort of a joint project. The collection was done by our consultants over the course of their seven years worth of incident responses. The analysis was done to some degree by the consultants, but also by our intelligence team, which is about 25 people who do this kind of work for a living. Some of them are technical, some of them are non-technical. And for example, we have uh, Chinese language speakers and people who understand the culture, people who lived over there. Um, so that group worked on the report itself. As far as how we got the information, there's been some misconception that we hacked into Chinese computers and that sort of thing, especially when you look at the video on YouTube. You're looking at desktops showing the, the Chinese actors interacting with victim systems, sending email, that sort of thing. And people said, well, first of all, that looks fake. Wouldn't Chinese computers be Chinese language and that sort of thing? And what did you do, break into the computers to see that sort of thing? It's, that's not at all what happened. Those are the hot points between the Chinese actor, his computer, and the ultimate victim. So we worked with those victims in that chain, uh, instrumented their systems, and were able to capture that video and then show it to you on YouTube. So they were proxying some of the connections through the victim computers, and those proxy victims were the ones that you were actually showing. That's right. That's exactly right. We had uh, hot points where there were connections coming into and out of those computers. Uh, in some cases, they were coming from other hot points, going to other hot points. Uh, but we were able to work with those owners because we consider them to be victims as well. Their data is not being stolen. They're just used to proxy or to launder the connections uh, as they go on to the ultimate victim. Which is a good point because a lot of um, a lot of people don't understand what the risks to their own computers are. They'll say, well, I don't do online banking. Well, I don't do this. Why mm -hmm. should I worry about protecting my computer? And so this is exactly one of the reasons why you should, right? Uh, that's very true. None of these companies, in some cases they weren't companies, they were universities and uh, uh, nonprofits and these uh, groups who had really, in many cases, no chance to protect themselves whatsoever. And they were simply being used as a pass through. And if you were to start working your way back that chain, uh, they were just as much a victim as the person who was having information stolen. What kind of um, effect has your report, after it was released, has it had any effect on the Chinese hacking community? Have they toned it down? Or? Well, we did see an initial drop in activity, but just from that one group, not from the other two dozen or so groups mm -hmm. that we track. And we think it had more to do with sort of an operational shock. It wasn't the government told them to stop or anything like that at all. Um, because shortly after they changed some of their techniques, they came back. And within maybe a month or so, they were already back to normal strength as far as the actions go. So um, when, when you're talking about the Chinese uh, actors as the initiators, how were you able to verify that they were in fact Chinese and not just another proxy in a chain? Mm -hmm. So the way to think about it is this. Um, we built on a lot of research that had been done previously. So for example, there's a report called, um, or, built, or written by the Project 2049 groups. So you can go to project2049.net. And they wrote a report in 2011 where they outlined uh, about 10 different Chinese units 
they were targeting different parts of the world. So there's a there's a five digit like we, we looked at six one three nine eight. They talked about six one three nine eight and how it tar targeted English language speakers. They talked about another unit that went after Russians, another unit that went after the Japanese and the South Koreans. One went after. So they looked at all these different groups. So we took a look at the stuff that we had collected over the course of seven years. Uh, all the technical indicators pointed in that direction. But then we also had all these non-technical indicators. So we said, well, if we had stumbled across one of these units, what would it look like? Well, they would have to speak English. They would advertise for English language speakers in universities. They would have a building to work in. We put all these things together and all the directions pointed at this one group. Now, that's not to say we didn't try other alternative hypothesis. We went through and said, well, could they be Russians who are trying to go through China? Could they be uh, underground hackers? Could they be patriotic hackers? And you could get one, two, three, four characteristics maybe to fit that hypothesis, but none fit as well as, well, this is 61398, and there you go. And then I think what was interesting as well was we got some confirmation on the ground, and we got some confirmation from the government. The, the ground confirmation was when we found this building that was previously no one had paid any attention to it, uh, whenever reporters tried to film it, they got chased by guards who self-identified as being 61398. Okay. Because uh, they hadn't gotten the memo yet. They, they weren't supposed to talk about this. And then secondly, the government uh, validated our findings, both in the forms of uh, con uh, Congress and Senate, the Intel Committees, and even uh, General Alexander's uh, assistant stopped by after you did at NSA and said that the general loved the report and you guys did a good job and got it right. Nice. So we've had all these little pieces come together. Since then. Have you had any? Have you had any confirmation from the Chinese government? I assume not. But no, um, no. We, we were actually asked, has the Chinese government contacted Mandiant and that sort of thing? No, we've had no direct contact with them, and they continue to maintain that it's uh, groundless and unprofessional and all these other things that we, that they have said through the years when anyone talks about this subject. I mean, it is an interesting argument, though, because I mean, with the political and, and financial situations with the United States and China, it does raise the question: Why would they want to do this? Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, I've, uh, there. So there's a. If you really want the why question, there's a wonderful book that just came out called Chinese Industrial Espionage. Uh, one of the authors is James Mulven, and I don't remember the names of the other two authors. They basically went through and gave the entire unclassified case as to what's going on with this. So I'd really recommend reading that. The short answer, though, is that it's a way for them to jumpstart their economy. Uh, if you think about it, two generations ago they were agrarian. Uh, most of the people didn't live in cities, and now they're basically the number two GDP in the world. Uh, advanced technology, um, they continually engage in strategic surprise. In other words, they're flying their jets before we thought that they would have them. They're getting advanced submarines before we thought that they, All of these things have somehow been accelerated, and this is one of the ways that they're doing it. So I hear that intruders tend to always get into the networks. What can companies do to protect themselves? <laughs> You're right. It's tough to keep an advanced intruder uh, away from your network. They're eventually going to find a way in if you're the target. Mm -hmm. So one of the techniques we promote at Mandiant is this idea that accept that they're going to find a way into the network, but detect them quickly, contain them so that they don't cause any real damage, and then kick them out of the network. Mm -hmm. So to that end, I've written a new book that talks about that model, and I'd like to present you with a copy of the book. Thank you so um, much. You even signed it for me. Yes. The, uh, the idea behind the book is there are lots of different ways to do that sort of work. You can look uh, in logs. You can look on, at the endpoint. This book, in particular, takes a look at the network. So it says, what can you do with network traffic to try to find bad guys? Um, the background uses, or the, the software in there uses uh, all open source tools. In fact, um, the core of it is based on something called Security Onion, which my friend Doug Burks uh, wrote and we use. Mm -hmm. So I recommend anybody who has a network, you'll if you're not collecting the sorts of data that I describe in the book, and it doesn't have to be about the tools, it's more about the kinds of data that's in it, uh, you'll probably find it helpful to uh, collect that data and then analyze it and find intruders. Absolutely. A lot of great information in here. And it is the practice of network security monitoring, understanding incident detection and response. So this is <laughs> Available for purchase now? Yeah, it's uh, it's out there. No Starch is the publisher. As you know, they put out really quality uh, books of mm -hmm. all different kinds. And uh, Bill Pollock, the publisher, worked with me to get this thing in, in print for Black Hat. Uh, you can download the electronic versions as well from No Starch if you get them there. Awesome. And uh, it's my fourth book, and the other three books are still uh, interesting and in print if you want to take a look at those as well. Very cool. <laughs> and you will be at DEF CON tomorrow morning, you said, signing books? Yes. So we had book signing yesterday for Mandiant, and then tomorrow I'll be with uh, No Starch to do a signing at DEF CON. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. I'll definitely look through this. You're welcome. Learn a few things myself, and hopefully this will help the community 
protect themselves where they where they need to protect themselves. Definitely. It has a cool praying mantis on it. It too. does. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Inspiration I, for that. Uh, so uh, many years ago, I studied uh, different forms of martial arts, and the very first one I studied was a northern praying mantis style. So my first book has a praying mantis, but it has a real praying mantis. Mm -hmm. For this book, I asked the artist, uh, Tina, if she could do something to that effect. And so she made the praying mantis with a little gi uh, standing in front of a data center, uh -huh. guarding the, gate, uh, the data center, which I thought was clever. Oh, nice. That was really cool. I like his posture. So in your book, do you cover um, primarily anomaly detection, or are you looking for, you know, specific types of data? So I, I advocate uh, two different types of models. One is what I call matching. In other words, you know what you need to find, go out there into the data and look for it. You can call those signatures, you can call that intelligence, whatever it is. The other model is called hunting, meaning you don't necessarily know what you're looking for, but when you start going through data, you're gonna find something you didn't expect. Um, and in fact, in the cert that I built at General Electric, we used to go on what we call hunting trips. In other words, a senior analyst takes a bunch of junior analysts on a tour through data, and always, I mean, as you probably know, you spend any amount of time in any kind of data, you'll find something interesting. Mm -hmm. And then the key though is that once you find something, you transition it into a match so that it can be done on an automated basis. Right. And then later on you go on a new hunting trip and you find something new. So that's the model I, I, I advocate matching and plus hunting for maximum effect. Awesome. So how do you see um, education, both at the end user as well as in the IT personnel and even up to executive management, um, being important in protecting against these types of attacks? I'm a big fan of education at all levels. Uh, I know there's been some debate in the community that says education is a waste of time because it's not 100% effective. I think that's really short-sighted. Um, at the user level, when I do the security orientation at Mandiant and I get up in front of all of our new hires, I spend most of my time going through different types of phishing emails that we get because the way you're going to beat us most easily is to get a phishing email through, if it can get through all of our technical defenses. And we get more reports from users who are getting those sorts of things than anything else. So they're aware that it's happening, they're a source of intelligence, and they help protect the company. So I'm a big fan of that. Uh, same thing on the technical side. If you have technical people who can keep up to date with what the problems are, that's the way, best way to defend yourself. Uh, and even at the executive level, those people are the ones who are approving budgets, and uh, this is not, this is a boardroom problem now because the SEC, if you're a publicly traded company, they want to know when you've had a breach. It's in their new clarification of, of disclosure guidance. So yeah, at all levels, education is really huge. Absolutely. We're all about education at Secure Ninja. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, Mandiant, Mandiant has accomplished so much in the last six months especially. What kind of goals do you guys have moving forward? I think one of the goals we have is to remove the collection of this data from the equation. In other words, if everybody had the right data, we could immediately go into what do you do about this problem. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that, that Mandiant has when we do our consulting is that we get to a site and we have to gather lots of, lots of data to figure out what's happening. And in some cases, gather the data and then hope the intruder is present or comes back. We'd really like to just say, what, is, what do we need to do as an industry just to have all of this data available? And then you can apply your intelligence to it, or you can get escalated support help from a company like Mandiant. And it just reduces the problem from one of weeks to maybe days or even hours. Um, the vision we have at Mandiant that Kevin Mandy, our, our CEO, says is he'd like, he'd like you to be walking through the airport with your iPad, and you get an alarm that says you have a potential intrusion. You click a button, you say, go gather more data. The data is then validated, and it says, yes, this looks like an intrusion, what would you like to do about it? Do you want to contain? And then you say, yes, contain. So you can deal with that whole problem in less than 10 minutes. And there are very few intruders on Earth who can operate in that tight a cycle. There are a few who can get it done in minutes, but most intruders, that would be very frustrating for them. Right. So that's the ultimate goal that we're trying to work towards. That's nice. That sounds pretty safe and secure. Well, good luck with uh, everything you're working on. Keep up the great work, and uh, thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you for having me. Definitely. We'd love to follow up, of course, maybe next year at RSA. We'll be there. Awesome. Thank <laughs> you. And everyone at home, thanks for watching. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, like us on Twitter. Keep up to date on everything we're producing here at Black Hat and at DEF CON. And definitely subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's probably the most important thing. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Alicia Webb, and my co-host, Michael Vien. Secure Ninja Shorts are brought to you by SecureNinja.com, a world leader in information security and IT training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. SecureNinja.com, forging IT security experts.